Okie dokie, then stop sharing and share again. Thank you. There you and go. There we go. Thanks, well, Randy. Everyone. So with this, I would like to welcome everyone to the New York Space Business Roundtable, where our conversation will be on deal flow in commercial space. This is the third in the series. Uh, while you are here, you are not able to unmute yourself um, because we're only going to allow our guests, our panelists to unmute and unmute. That said, we invite you to take advantage of the chat functionality in Zoom. That is open. If you have questions, thoughts, concerns, or just want to keep the conversation going, the chats are available. At the one o'clock mark, there will be a question and answer period, and you are welcome to, you will be welcome to unmute yourself at that point. And so with that, I'm happy to turn the conversation over to Mr. Lou Zaccarilla. Over to you, Lou. Well, thank you, Tamara, and uh, hello, everyone. If it's the third Wednesday of the month, it's the New York Space Business Roundtable, although this month it's not. Uh, and the reason for that is because of the satellite show. So we moved the round table uh, to today. But um, as usual, uh, you've all shown up and we've got a, a great, great lineup for you today. Um, let me tell you a little bit about um, what we'll be talking about, which is um, Luxembourg. Um, Luxembourg has a population of about 640,000 people. That's, for those of you in the United States, about the size of Nashville, Tennessee. Um, yet for the past four decades, uh, it's been very active, uh, not so much in country music, but in the business of space. And in fact, uh, it's become a powerhouse, attracting investments, spinning innovations, and demonstrating the promise of our new era in commercial space. Uh, as you know, it's been home to the leading satellite operator since 1985, and it launched its first commercial satellite as far back as the last year of the Reagan administration in the United States. In 2008, it implemented a forward-looking space policy and five years ago inaugurated its own space agency. Uh, Luxembourg Space Directory, uh, unlike other countries with space agencies, is really a who's who of the space value chain. Uh, it's really the, uh, the stars um, of the industry demonstrating an ecosystem built for investment. Um, this is a very well thought out program, a national program for economic growth and development. Um, innovation intended to spike national GDP from Redwire, who you're going to be hearing from today, to Spire, who you may be hearing from today, to Earth Lab companies around the world. Uh, they are thriving and finding a culture there. So this is all being done by design and through steady, careful planning. And it's a serious commitment to uh, contributing to the peaceful exploration and sustainable utilization of space resources for the benefit of all of us. So with that said, um, I'm going to uh, welcome you all and we're going to do something. We, we've got a lot of uh, video recorded uh, folks today. So we're going to um, uh, move through this and hopefully you know, with, with few glitches and uh, Tamara's gonna guide me through. Um, by the way, we couldn't do this without our friends around the world, our media partner, uh, Space News, and you'll be hearing from uh, Jason Rainbow later today. He'll be talking a little bit about Luxembourg. The World Teleport Association, um, the world's only nonprofit trade association for operating teleports and their partners around the world uh, is supporting us. And we've got Randall Barney um, with us behind the scenes today. So Randy, welcome. Druva Space, uh, a new sponsor in India. We welcome them back. And of course, uh, the Luxembourg Trade and Investment Agency from the nation of Luxembourg uh, has been supporting us. So thank you to all of them uh, and to all of the members uh, of SSPI uh, for their ongoing support. Okay, what I'm gonna show you next, uh, as we always do, we run a video from our Better Satellite World campaign typically. This one was very special because it was shown last week, it premiered last week for the first time, underwritten by uh, Planet. 
Um, and it's on a very, very important topic, which of course our industry is significantly engaged with. It previewed at our Hall of Fame induction. And Tamara, before uh, we run that video, I wanted to just congratulate the three inductees to the industry's Hall of Fame this year. As many of you know, SSPI runs the Industry Hall of Fame and we inducted uh, Mark Miller of Viasat, the man who invented high throughput, uh, probably one of the most significant people ever in our industry, Dave Kagan uh, of Global Star, and Joe Spytek of Speedcast. So we'd like to once again congratulate those, uh, those gentlemen uh, on being inducted uh, to the Hall of Fame. So with that, this is the video that played that night. If you were lucky to have been invited to that Hall of Fame event at KNL Gates. In 2017, North Korea shocked the world by launching tests of two ballistic missiles able to cross the Pacific and strike the US. One just missed hitting a commercial passenger flight headed for Tokyo. The UN Security Council slapped a severe penalty on the rogue nation, a limit on the amount of fuel and crude oil it could import. The hope was that, with no oil reserves of its own, North Korea would soon feel the pressure to change its ways. Except it didn't. Two years later, the country conducted no fewer than 20 missile tests. What went wrong? There is a high demand for black market fuel from East Asia. Price differences between nations make it profitable to buy low in one place and sell high in another, if you can do it without getting caught. But with oil traders operating in the shadows, it's impossible to stop the trade or even slow it down. Or is it? A British charity, the Royal United Services Institute, decided to try. The Institute turned for help to Planet, a leading provider of satellite imagery. The Institute then worked with global security non-profit C4ADS to review hundreds of images from Planet's global archive. That painstaking work identified at least 100 oil deliveries that North Korea failed to report to the UN. Overall, the Institute estimated that North Korea imported four times more fuel in a single year than it should have. Planet operates about 200 satellites in low Earth orbit. Together, they take pictures and download images of the entire Earth's landmass every day. Those images proved key to uncovering smuggling in action. They showed big tankers docked in East Asian nations where they legally bought fuel. Out at sea, the ships rendezvoused with smaller tankers and transferred the fuel to them for delivery to North Korean ports in violation of the law. Using Planet's high-resolution images, the Institute was able to identify individual ships. New stories followed, bringing attention to the United Nations investigators, and North Korea found it harder and more expensive to smuggle its way to success. Year by year, companies like Planet are dispelling the shadows where illegal activity hides. Day by day, satellites bring a bit more of the Earth into the light. Space and satellite, the world's invisible, indispensable technologies. Brought to you by Space and Satellite Professionals International, with the support of Planet. Additional support provided by Artel and RKF Engineering. Okay, um, and again, we'd like to uh, thank those organizations for helping us um, put this video together. Um, obviously, the satellite industry plays a role in just about every aspect of uh, our human life. And this one uh, obviously was critical enough for us to want to spend some time on it. But we're going to be talking about um, other things today uh, that maybe may be a little lighter in topic. But some of the good news, as this industry continues to emerge uh, on the commercial side, entrepreneurship uh, continues to flourish. We have had some developments with our SSPI India chapter. 
as many of you know, it's one of our fastest growing chapters. We've been very lucky uh, to have been getting a lot of support from the U.S. India uh, Business Council on this. And um, last month in Washington, there was a, a significant meeting of the, the Civil Space Working Group, the uh, leading organizations in space and commerce from both nations uh, met in Washington for a, a high level discussion. There was a, a lot of output uh, from that, a lot of talk as there always is, but what is really becoming clear is that entrepreneurship is beginning to flourish in India. There have been several associations now formed. Um, Daruva Space, one of our sponsors is maybe the best example of the growth of the entrepreneurial uh, class in commercial space in India. Uh, they are now vertically integrating and seeking additional financing. So there's a lot going on. And um, I remind people that India banned TikTok. And, um, you know, after experiencing some really crabby kids over there, uh, they developed their own version of it, which the United States hasn't even done yet. So uh, entrepreneurship uh, and innovation uh, do continue to flourish, and we monitor it through our SSPI India chapter. Um, for those of you who uh, haven't had a chance to look at what uh, occurred from that civil space working group, we've got about a minute and a half report that came from Anil Prakash uh, from the uh, Space Industry Association uh, in India, and uh, he is going to let us know a little bit about what took place, and then we've got more information on the SSPI India page on our website. So, Anil, over to you. Hello, friends from SSPI. Warm greetings from CI India, New Delhi. Thanks for inviting me at New York Space Business Roundtable. It is my pleasure to address you today on the topic of the U.S.-India Civil Space Joint Working Group and significant advancement it has made in bilateral space collaboration. The recent meeting of the U.S.-India Civil Space Joint Working Group held on January 30th and 31st, 2023 brought together the officials from the United States and India to discuss collaboration in Earth and space science, human space exploration, global navigation, satellite system, space flight safety, and a space situational awareness and policies of commercial space. The discussion also included implementation of guidelines and best practices developed by United States Nations Committee on Peaceful Use of Outer Space to ensure the long-term sustainability of outer space activities. The growing partnership between India and U.S. was visible at Aero India 2023 the U.S. delegation to Aero India 2023 was one of the biggest ever in the, the premier aviation exhibition history. According to United States, Charles D. F.A., Ambassador to India, Elizabeth Jones, showcasing the importance of bilateral relations, Ms. Elizabeth That was it, Tamara? Apparently, that was the end of it, I, uh, which was a weird place to stop. But that said, I'm very happy to say that the entire report and the Word document of the report can be found on the SSPI India site. I'm going to put that link in the chats right now. OK, thank you. Um, you know, and as Anil was saying, it, it was a, a hot, very, very high level uh, gathering. and. The thinking is that we actually did uh, push some things forward on the commercial side. And, and you know, it's, it's been a long time waiting in India, but it, it looks like it's really happening. Um, one thing that uh, I can assure you is that our next speaker will not cut himself short um, mm -hmm. because he is one of the best reporters in our industry. Uh, he's with us every other month. Uh, it's, of course, Jason Rainbow from Space News, who will give us our significant digits report. And we've asked him to talk a little bit about uh, Luxembourg and his observation. Um, Jason, welcome. Hi, welcome. Yeah, fingers crossed the Wi-Fi holds over here. It's been a bit, a little bit dodgy uh, today. So okay. I'll, I'll, I'll come back if I do disappear, I promise. All right. Um, well, listen, you were disappearing at the satellite show last week. Every time I saw you, you were on the move to another story. 
I mean, it, it, it had to be an inc- I mean, you're always like that, but it, it looked even more intense this year. It does. Yeah, it felt that way. Um, no shortage of news. Um, there was even news be- shortly before the event. A lot of companies wait until the event takes place before they start distributing their announcements. But before, in the middle, after, now there is still news coming out uh, from the industry. It's just there is just so much going on all over the place. And that's a great thing, surely. It's, uh, you know, journalists have to work a lot harder when there isn't so much news out there. Um, <laughs> that's right. And, and you're going to be jumping into Space Symposium uh, next month as well. Um, you know, Jason, I, as you uh, give us your report, I was looking back through uh, Space News going to the beginning of Luxembourg and European New Space, right, when, when they were first kicking this off. And Jeff Faust actually did a report on that. I don't know if you remember that, um, but he was he had a really sort of a cute quote from um, Etienne Schneider, who at the time was the uh, deputy prime minister. Um, and they were talking about what they were attempting to do at Luxembourg with regard to now what has been a very successful ecosystem build for the commercial space industry. And he said that um, at a conference back in 2017, the leader of the opposition, the biggest opposition party, wanted to offer him a one-way ticket to Mars. He, he thought the idea was so crazy. But the focus on development of commercial space in Luxembourg, I mean, by everybody's accounting, has been a success. Um, obviously, you know, the, the Luxembourg Future Fund found a, a Spire getting a $70 million investment. And, and we'll be speaking with Redwire, you know, as I said, one of the stars in this sector shortly. Um, I'm going to turn it over to you. Has has Luxembourg developed the model for the space agency of the future? That's an interesting one. Yeah, because they do seem to be very willing to take on even the riskier parts of the the, the emergent space market. So the deep space mining um, part, which you know didn't go quite as planned. I think Luxembourg lost some some uh, of their investments there, but they are building up a broad ecosystem. So not just space mining, but um, companies uh, range, whether you mentioned uh, Redwire, um, a set up shop there, uh, yeah, Spire Global, others, iSpace, Japanese Lunar Landing Company, uh, building were based there. So they are um, diversifying um, or seeking to diversify their activities in the space sector, which will help shield them um, from the uncertainty, which you know, there's no sh- lack of that in the in industry. Um, and yeah, as you mentioned, they've been uh, an important area for space activity in Europe for, for decades. Yeah. Um, and uh, I think I recall the, the Luxembourg Space Agency recently about there being more than 80 public private uh, companies or actors uh, in uh, including academic actors uh, with the capabilities across the space value chain in the country. So a very diversified, interesting mix. Um, still early days, of course, but um, yeah, they, they've really been pushing the the uh, the boat out uh, as it as it were. But for, for today, I'd like to bring attention to a recent deal. I think helps underline the kind of role that Luxembourg wants to play in the global space industry because. I think it's important how that could trickle down to its domestic market and the, and the shape of things to come. And, and that's last month, uh, Luxembourg's government said it was going to buy more than $200 million worth of capacity from O3B Mpower, which is a new constellation of broadband satellites. SES recently started deploying in medium Earth orbit. SES is an established satellite operator, which like Intelsat has its corporate headquarters in, in Luxembourg. Um, but this deal, it, it's part of a 10-year program called MEO Global Services, or MGS, that will provide sovereign solutions for defense and disaster recovery missions. Governments don't normally um, sign up to, to new constellations until it's already in service and, and truly proven out its capabilities. Uh, and I think O3B Empower is still a few months away from, from initial services. They're still deploying satellites. So it's, it's quite an interesting commitment, um, but importantly, and directly connected to this, uh, the deal came a few months after Luxembourg and the United States agreed a framework with the aim of commercially contracting satellite communication capabilities through the NATO Support and Procurement Agency. So essentially what MGS does is it gives the US and other NATO allies 
a way to carve out a part of O3B Empower's network for their own sovereign needs. And that's all facilitated by Luxembourg's government. And um, you know, it's, it, the framework is also designed to make it easy for other nations to contribute their satellites to the mix. So I think this really helps underline how Luxembourg wants to play a central role in delivering next generation space capabilities. It, it does have a very um, symbiotic relationship with SES, which is, it, it's a for-profit commercial company listed on the, on the stock market. Um, but in a statement that came out with this announcement, Luxembourg's current deputy uh, prime minister talked about how this deal consolidates its position as a reliable partner in space. And he said it will help reinforce Euro-Atlantic joint deterrence and defense activities, mm -hmm. which we all know are increasingly important capabilities um, that space companies can, can provide in the wake of Russia's war in Ukraine. And it's not the only partnership the country has with SES. There's a, a public-private joint venture I think we're going to hear a lot more about uh, today that the government has with uh, the operator called GovSat, which has its own satellite that is dedicated for government and institutional users. And so I think it's going to be really interesting to see what role Luxembourg and Luxembourg companies will play in uh, Europe's upcoming sovereign multi-orbit broadband constellation called Iris Squared. Um, that's something I'm definitely hoping to hear more about from your panel today. So really looking forward to this. Uh, thank you for inviting me. Thanks uh, so much, Jason. Just one quick question. You got about 30 seconds on this one because Tamara's reminding me that I'm behind schedule already. But uh, terrific report. When you talk about next gen, is is Luxembourg also a next gen investing climate? Uh, you know, again, I'm 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 sort of pushing to make the case that this is this is what it should look like. It does it it does seem to be yeah because a lot of say launch for instance have, it is very much taken care of by SpaceX in the US and so there are only certain parts of the market where it's still kind of technically possible for um, maybe a country in Europe to to be a leader of the pack but importantly Luxembourg isn't the only one that's trying to get involved in these um, next generation emerging space markets like space mining on orbit servicing um, the UK for instance too has said this is going to be a very important part of the post Brexit economy so. Super interesting to hear perhaps later today about um, what Luxembourg brings to the table to help develop that because it's a highly competitive market out there. Absolutely, yeah. And, and as we say, they've, they've kind of jumped in first, but uh, Jason, thanks again for making the time and uh, you know, finally sitting down uh, after a, couple, a week above running. Um, appreciate it and we'll see you next month. Thank you, thank you, always a pleasure. Thank you. Okay, um, so that, that starts us off. You get a sense of what's going on in Luxembourg. Now let's bring in our guests for today and uh, I will introduce them to you. Um, first up, uh, we have uh, Jonathan Bailiff. Jonathan is the Chief Financial Officer uh, of Redwire Space. Um, there's a lot going on uh, in Europe uh, through Redwire these days and we'll hear a little bit about that. Let me tell you a little bit about Jonathan though, for those of you who don't know him. Uh, he's been a leader in our in the aerospace, energy, and infrastructure sectors for two and a half decades. Uh, he's been a public company senior exec and an investment and commercial banker. He served on the Redwire's board of directors and chair of the audit committee um, for the last uh, two years. And he serves as board of directors and audit committee. Um, uh, he serves on that uh, board uh, of Texas Capital Bank shares as well. Um, most recently, he was the president of Genesis Park Acquisition Corp, the special purpose acquisition corporation that merged uh, with Redwire. Before that, he was a managing director in Credit Suisse's Global Energy Group, and he spent almost a decade flying F-4 Phantom Fighter aircraft in the United States Air Force, including combat missions during the first Gulf War. Jonathan, welcome to the New York Space Business Roundtable. Thank you very much, Lou. Appreciate it. And uh, glad to be back because obviously I participated in the roundtable uh, that we did in New York last year, which I thought was um, super successful with obviously not just, um, you know, his, uh, his highness or the, the, the Duke, the Grand Duke, and then also the, um, you know, tremendous amount of support from Wall Street that was at the previous, uh, previous function. So glad to be here again. Well, it's great to have you. And you'll tell us more about Redwire, but they're a leader. Um, 
uh, for mission critical space solutions and high reliability components for the next generation space economy. And we'll again, talk about what that actually means. Uh, also joining Jonathan today is uh, Stefan Herbrandt. He's the director of governmental satellite communications at GovSat, which uh, Jason mentioned. And he's also a member of SSPI's Luxembourg chapter. So um, we're delighted to have him today. Stefan, welcome. Thank you as well. Good, hello everyone. Pleased to be here. And uh, again, thank you for, for making the time for us. Um, and we'll also be hearing uh, later from a special guest, uh, the CEO of Luxembourg Space Agency with whom we did a conversation as well. Um, Jonathan, I'm gonna, I'm gonna start with you. Um, there, I mean, every time I read something, you guys have got something going on in Europe. Um, first of all, talk to us a little bit about Redwire and what's been happening in the recent past, because I think people want to catch up because they've been hearing a lot about you. Sure. I mean, I'm going to, I'm going to take it to like, you know, top down, but try to do it really quickly. No. Well, you, you flew the F4, so you can do that. But, you know, that's the interesting thing. So I, I'm going to say the same thing I said in New York. You know, one of the things that's interesting for me, my life has a tendency to go circles, is I, my, one of my first stationing, you know, one, people, one of the things that people don't understand about Luxembourg and aerospace generally is Luxembourg has been the center of aerospace since really, I mean, prior to World War II. But if people don't know, the center of uh, U.S. Air Force um, aircraft, especially fighter aircraft, is in the Benelux and, and Western Germany. I was stationed um, less than eight kilometers from the Luxembourg border. In fact, I, I probably went to Luxembourg more often than I went to German cities. And so that whole area has had a tremendous interaction with uh, the Department of Defense, NASA, for years. And, and, and Luxembourg has been the beneficiary of that. But also, uh, the U.S. has been a beneficiary of creating hubs in aerospace, especially cargo, if you don't know, in aerospace. Luxembourg is one of, if not the major European hub for cargo. And Cargo Lux is one of the major providers of cargo um, in the world. And from that, you then see the, the branching out uh, of space, right? It is a very natural extension, similar to my career in aerospace, um, where now I'm a space executive. And so I think what Luxembourg is doing in conjunction with companies like Redwire is a very natural extension of decades, if not almost a century long history in aerospace and now space for reasons we'll talk about. Yeah, well, the, thank you. I think that's a good setup. I mean, there, so there's an evolution here. Um, this is not something where, you know, Stefan and his countrymen decided, oh, gee, you know, let's, space looks good. Let's, let's go into the commercial space. This is something that's evolved. It's a, it's a logical step. Um, but I want to ask you a little bit about Redwire. Um, sure. Again, you guys are sort of an evolution of our industry. I mean, I've been in this industry probably longer than you. You that's guys are also one that has evolved. Talk to me a little right. bit about where you guys are today. Yeah, so Redwire is really one of the only pure play space infrastructure companies on the planet, right? We are formed um, over the past two and a half years uh, from nine companies that have decades long experience um, providing uh, space components, systems, payloads. Um, we've been on everything from Gemini to recently Perseverance to just did uh, the eyes of Orion on Artemis. If, if, you know, we're, we're kind of going to use some new taglines over the next year, a little like Intel inside, it's Redwire inside. Pretty much every spacecraft, every satellite has a piece of equipment. We make the stuff that makes space work. And so if anything from uh, communications components to power supply systems, if you think about terrestrial infrastructure where it's power, communications, toll roads, which is really for space navigation and, and uh, orientation, digital engineering, soon to be some of the major robot arms in the, in the space ecosystem. We make it work and we service it because that's an exciting part of space is now you can actually begin to service your equipment in space, very similar to other heavy equipment. We've teamed up in Luxembourg. It's very rare that you see a space infrastructure company like ourselves, decades long experience in the United States, but very early on in the formation over the past, let's call it two years, it was very important that we would partner um, even really as Redwire was getting formed with uh, the Luxembourg Space Agency um, to be able to provide um, you know, what we consider is our initially a toehold or really a foothold in European space through Luxembourg. So we chose Luxembourg very deliberately to house one of our highest tech pieces of equipment development, uh, which is our start robot arm. Um, but there's other equipment that we will end up um, putting in place. 
But interestingly, we did that two years ago. But just recently, in the last six months, on November 1st, Redwire now has acquired um, the kinetic space carve out. So there was a, a business as part of the British conglomerate Kinetic. They had a kinetic space company um, located just outside of Antwerp, Belgium. We have now purchased that and made it part of the Redwire family. That is, again, it's very important to note that's separate from you know, Luxembourg. So we actually operate Luxembourg somewhat separately, but it is part of an overall strategy to be a global provider of space infrastructure, systems, digital engineering, et cetera. We're, we're, we're a peer play, which means that we're not part of the bigger primes. They are our clients. But you know, this was, um, in many ways, uh, we wouldn't have done it had we not done Luxembourg. We, in fact, felt that uh, Luxembourg and the, and the partnership we've seen really springboards into now uh, a major acquisition. I mean, this was tens of millions of dollars of investment um, with that Belgian entity, but they do work together to create what we now call Redwire European Space. And so that's a really important part of what Redwire wants to do. We're expanding in the midst of, as you know, a global uh, financial crisis. We feel it's so important. European space is such an important strategic um, initiative for us that we're willing to put our money where our mouth is. And then we just look at the capabilities that we have in Luxembourg and how that helps Belgium and, and our Belgium entity, which then sells all throughout ESA and outside of ESA and then vice versa, right? So they, they end up becoming quite symbiotic because of the nature of both the location. And as you know, um, it's called the Benelux for a reason because the countries operate quite closely on a number of different uh, science and space um, initiatives. Very good. And, and again, you know, Luxembourg is, is, as you say, is the base for the activities now that are going forward. Um, by the way, was the Kinetic deal a SPAC as well? Is it? No, no. So Kinetic uh, is a public company um, listed on the London Exchange. It's a very large company, you know, that went public uh, in the mid 2000s. And no, they ended up having a subsidiary um, that uh, was extremely successful, has been around mm -hmm. over 35 years. So this entity has been around a long time. Uh, very similar to some of the other um, parts of Redwire. We don't really talk about, we, we're talking a little bit about the history of this company, but once they become Redwire, it's one Redwire, right? So they are part now of right. Redwire Space, um, which again, our Luxembourg entity, which was the first one, is also a major, uh, major part. Got it. Thanks, you, Jonathan. Uh, Stefan, that's, that's a pretty good endorsement uh, for Luxembourg from, you know, a company that, that obviously um, is moving in this area of commercial space infrastructure. Um, you know, it would seem to me if I didn't know what I know about you guys and what I know about uh, my friend Jonathan here, that there was, there's been some level of governmental private sector collaboration in your country that is enabling this investment climate uh, to be so conducive. Do, is that, a, is that a fair setup for you? Yeah, um, I think we, we are a perfect example uh, of this. We are uh, the COFSAT as such, uh, the, or the legal entity name, entity name is uh, Lux COFSAT, is a public-private venture uh, where Luxembourg government uh, owns 50% and the other 50% is owned by SES. Um, and that was for me also, let's say, back in 2016 when I joined the company, uh, what attracts me uh, is that climate, uh, that that uh, spirit, the entrepreneurial spirit, as was mentioned before, um, to 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 do something creative within uh, what is rather a, a conservative uh, and very stable environment. Government business, government business is by default not really flexible, known as flexible. However, they will they were really able to, to give that a twist uh, by creating the company, COVSAT. And since 2018, we operate our own satellite, COVSAT-1, which is a military geostationary satellite, um, fulfilling, let's say, their um, obligations towards NATO or towards other nations. On, and on the other hand, it uh, enables us also to, let's say, commercialize between brackets, of course, uh, the, the, the remaining capacity to other member states or any other NATO agency, a UNAID agency that would require uh, capacity. So that is a perfect example to me where something that looks really fixed and, and, and unflexible to, to twist it into something that is a, 
a, a, an enabler for them to create uh, business, to keep the technology, to keep um, that know, know how in country and create visibility awareness on a global scale. Right. So again, you know, to some extent, GovSat is the enabler, right? It's, it's a very specific enabler uh, yes. for the kinds of ventures that you would like Jonathan to experience uh, in the country. Uh, is that fair? Absolutely. It, it's, it was also indeed inspired by, at that time by Etienne Schneider. Um, yes. That that uh, that that uh, yeah was indeed a strange um, let's say uh, in, in a way is a bit of a strange move for the government. However, if we look now back to what has been uh, created uh, over the last six seven years, it's amazing. It's really yeah. amazing, not only in our business, but uh, in the different segments, uh, whether it's uh, debris, whether it's uh, Leo, Mio, Geo, uh, Earth observation, just name it. It's it's developing in all areas uh, from hardware to software development to operational uh, assets. It's amazing. Yeah. yeah, it really has been. And um, Mr. Schneider took that ticket to Mars. He said, as long as I don't have to pay for it, I'm, I'm happy because we're going to be up there pretty soon. Right? Uh, <laughs> um, cool. you, you know, before I, I cut away to um, uh, Mark, uh, our next guest uh, as well, Tamara, can you just put up the slide for the Luxembourg chapter, not, not to promote our, our SSPI Luxembourg chapter, but just to follow up on what Stefan said. Um, you know, obviously they're passionate um, for sure. That next slide, though, I think gives you a sense also of some of the things Jonathan was talking about, which is, um, you know, you've got a culture there um, that is looking to, you know, be the enabler, if you will. Um, it's really important to have this network in place so that the human beings, you know, who do business together um, can do so. I mean, we've just started up in India. We're beginning to see the benefits. But again, Luxembourg has been doing this a long time. Um, Stefan, do you briefly want to talk a little bit about the importance of that network? And then I'm going to uh, go to the CEO yeah. of the space agency to get his take on it. Yeah, it's, 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 uh, let's say Luxembourg was, was uh, back in the days known as SES. And that was it basically on, on, on space and, and satellite as such. Um, over the last decade, uh, an, enormous number of different companies and different activities within space has been developed. And that's why we said we, we would like to bring that community together. Although it's a very small country uh, and we, we, we do have uh, a lot of, um, let's say, uh, workforce that is uh, living in the neighboring countries, but moving every day into Luxembourg, we were like, we need something that brings all these different um let's say activities together in in a in another not necessarily uh doing the business but bringing and, and offering the network capability and knowing each other and knowing what's going on that was uh the reason why we created end of 2019 just before covid uh the, yeah. the luxembourg chapter and today we we are quite uh happy with the uh, success we have and the um, let's say the the number of of of, um, of members uh, we can we can host on on our events. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, before before I cut away, um, Jonathan, do you have you found the um, the workforce and the culture to be um, an advantage in Luxembourg? Have you had an experience? Well, I mean, I, I think there's three things about the workforce that's important, not just me as a senior executive at Redwar, but also as CFO, right? Um, right? You just have a confluence of very important, um, you know, I would say skill set, experience. You don't have to travel far to get to an accountant, to get to a lawyer, to get to somebody who understands. Because, you know, the, the, the thing about space is space is a team sport, right? Everybody's a client, right. everybody's a collaborator, everybody's a competitor. And, and there's also a lot of issues associated with export controls, and so for me, the number one thing um, that Luxembourg provides is in a very small space, and I'm talking about you could walk 
uh, to uh, my, my auditors. I can walk to the, my um, lawyers. In a very small space, I can get the engineering talent, the financial talent, the legal talent in one very close space. That is unusual, right? I don't care where you are in Europe, in the world, you really only have centers like that in much larger countries. But in Luxembourg, you actually get it in a place that's it's actually a bit more uh, cost efficient. And I mean that. That's the second thing I'm saying. From a cost efficiency standpoint, Luxembourg, which is not necessarily known as a low cost country, I'm just telling right. you. But, but from an efficiency standpoint, Luxembourg, super efficient for me to bring talent from all over the world to Luxembourg, right? It's in a time zone that works. It's very easy to work with our major clients in space. And so for me, very efficient. And when you get to efficiency, that means cost eventually, but I'm talking about efficiency. I think the third thing is it's an entrepreneurial country, right? I mean, it's a country that is used to investing in high growth areas. And I don't care if it's, you know, uh, I do care if it's space, but I do care, understand that it's also AI, computation, financial, anything associated with resource and resource evaluation, the evaluation of risk, right? When you look at that, yeah, location is unbelievable. And that's really why we're there. That's why we started in Luxembourg because the entrepreneurial client they or the entrepreneurial um, culture combined with the um, capabilities, you won't find that really in too many other areas on the planet. Yeah, the de-risking element is one, you know, again, that uh, you'll hear more about, but uh, you obviously experienced that as a CFO. You, you because this Absolutely. space is not, yeah, space is a risky business uh, still, but it's far less so. You're risky um, business, but actually a lot of the legal frameworks are still being figured out, right? Yeah, for the, sure. The nature of, um, it's still pretty, you know, it's still maturing. The large satellites, much more mature, but when you're talking about Leo commercialization, space habitation, yeah, other things associated with commercialization, it's still a pretty new industry. Yeah, uh, technology's run way ahead of the ability to regulate it. Um, it, by the way, did I hear you say it's an advantage to walk a short distance to get to a lawyer? I don't know. Is that okay? Is. Look, I'm, I'm, maybe I'm old school post pandemic, but I still think that you can get most of your naughty problems solved face to face. Um, as much as I enjoy um, Zooms and Teams, I think it really does matter. I can tell you, our our you know the lead executive in Luxembourg, um, and remember the tram is free in Luxembourg. If people didn't know that, you can get around free using their tram. Um, it makes a big difference to be able to do this stuff face to face. Absolutely. Um, Tamara, I, I just want to let people know we've got a third guest here. Um, he couldn't join us live, but uh, Mark Saras is the CEO of the Luxembourg Space Agency. We did a, a sit down with him for this roundtable. And I just want to cut to uh, Mark talking about the kinds of investments that are sought and desirable, and then also why he thinks the national and cultural experience, which Jonathan and Stefan have talked about, uh, is important in terms of in investment there. And then we'll come out on the other side and talk about maybe some of the downside of being in Luxembourg. What, at the moment, what type of investments would you say are the most solid, reliable, or perhaps desirable in terms of, again, going into Luxembourg? You, 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 you mean from a domain point of view or? Yeah, if, if I would. If I were an investor coming in now, and you, you know, you've got dozens and dozens of companies there, and, and many of them are going to scale or, or just need certain conditions around them to scale. Where would you say someone should be looking to Luxembourg, or what what might they not know about what is very suitable right now to come in and, um, as we say, plunk down the dollars? Yeah, well, we have um, an approach that is relatively bottom up in the sense that. We refrained really to define from the top uh, where the investments should take place. And we are doing that because there are so many factors that influence the success of a company that we cannot influence. And so it's important here that when an entrepreneur comes to Luxembourg, that he has a clear vision on what he wants to develop and which market he wants to address. And, um, and so, yeah. It's not so easy to answer, but I would say that we have a general scheme that is really oriented towards, uh, you know, understanding what the entrepreneur wants to do and and how we can support this development, whatever he is targeting or which whichever market he's targeting, but it needs to be commercial. 
that's right. sort of okay. constant. We want to have com companies here that have commercial activities. It may take two, three years when it's more, let's say, software driven, up to 10 plus years if they develop more sophisticated things that maybe fly. So also from the timing point of view can be very different. And now relating that to the investment community, of course, for the different types of applications that are targeted here, you have different types of investors. An investor that would invest in a software company that is developing applications based on data, for example, I just take this example, uh, has probably a shorter term cycle to reach the market and, and you know grow on the market, whereas a company that is developing uh, hardware technology will be interesting for another type of investor who is looking into it maybe from a longer term perspective. So we, we have a large variety. And again, I think the, the common aspect that we are looking here into is commercialization and really clear commitment and engagement and vision of the entrepreneurs to go in the direction. Mark, last question. This is more of, this is sort of my personal question. I remember as a very, very little boy, and I was just watching a documentary again about President Kennedy when he committed our, my country uh, to a space race, uh, but ultimately it landed us on the moon and we brought the rest of the world along with us. Um, the level of enthusiasm in the culture from that point on was, it, it was almost like a, a national festival of science and possibility and, and uh, human poetry. I mean, it all began to flourish. Um, we're in a different place now, of course, with commercial space and the industry, but there's still, I find, a, a level of enthusiasm among the talented people who want to come into our industry. Is Luxembourg experiencing that, or do you experience that to this day? Absolutely, absolutely. I think space has kept this uh, characteristic of fa um, fascinating people. It's extremely inspiring. When we organize events uh, with kids or even with, with uh, you know, not necessarily with kids, when we invite an astronaut, for example, you know, just, you know, there are, you, you have uh, stars in the eyes of all the people participating. Yeah. And, and space from that perspective, beyond now the the, the the scientific or uh, or business aspects has this incredible power to inspire the people and i don't know exactly where it's coming from but it's you know you you cannot control that no and that's that right. that's fabulous and and yes we see it i think each time we organize this type of events we see it in the eyes of the people participating so this is there and we should also as business people try to to you know to use this fascination also to uh, you know to create these opportunities uh, from a business perspective yeah i think that was a very good answer um jonathan you're nodding your head um there's that level of enthusiasm that he spoke of i don't I, you know i've been part of so many industries my my 40 year career including military and uh, you know redwire you know <laughs> We could put out, you know, just a very small press release just concerning, you know, interesting technologies, and we'll get 400,000 views, you know, and we're a, we're a big company in this space. We have over, you know, uh, on a pro forma basis, $200 million of revenue, but I'm just always amazed in this industry, and I've only been doing this industry, for, you know, exclusively for about two years. It's just how quickly the retail public picks up on the industry of space. Uh, and, and by the way, here's the other thing, cuts across political views, cuts across countries, cuts across, it doesn't matter if you're from Antarctica or Australia or Austria, you know, you're everybody, kids, grandmothers, it's pretty impressive. It's, it's one of the things I'm, I'm super excited about in this space. Now, there's a downside to it too. You're in a microscope um, and you really need to perform operationally, financially, commercially, right? There's been a lot of expectations placed on this industry. In fact, I, in, in some ways, sometimes yeah. um, on what we can do um, safely um, and responsibly. So I, I think there's an element there that we have to be careful of too. Yeah, that's, I think that's very well said. Um, 
by the way, Mark's uh, entire interview with me is going to be uh, released as a podcast by SSPI, and we'll tell you about that because it was terrific. Uh, Stephane, uh, Stephane, last sort of segment uh, and word to you. Um, Two-part question, really, just picking up on what Jonathan said. Um, the need to perform at a very high level commercially is going to probably become more intense because as I always say, Nepal has a space agency now too. So everybody's gonna continuously get in this game. They're gonna look at what they do well on the industrial side as their industrial heritage and try to move it into the space age. So that puts one level of pressure on you. The, the second uh, part of that question then is, um, what concerns you the most with regard to future investments coming into Luxembourg? Well, um, keeping that, um, let's say, um, there, are, there are a lot of initiatives and that's fine. And we still see them uh, popping up. Now, however, um, let's say, what after two, three years, where are we then exactly and what's happening with that initial investment in with that initial development can we keep that uh, let's say that talent that know-how in country or is that then going to be uh, let's say exported or, mm -hmm. or or going to be moved away relocated to other places that's a, a challenge um that's a threat we we see um so um, when when people start an initiative, it's all shiny and 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 the, as long as the money is there, is we're we're okay. But at a certain point in time, you need to deliver. You need to make it profitable, and that's always the tricky point where then some people might be bought by others and moved away from here. So that's keep it keep it for of the long term uh, reliable uh, or uh, as a reliable partner investment is what i see now that doesn't count for us we are we are a bit special on this but if i look around to what's happened there's a lot of changes moving around um, and that's that's what i see the stability missing a bit long-term stability but i think that's yeah that goes hand in hand with the risk on one hand that we we take and with the fast changing environment if you look uh, how quickly the market is changing it was a very uh in, in satellites in general but sp specifically in communication was a very very traditional market it, over the last you know let's say 20 years nothing happened and some fine tuning on 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 let's say performances however now the last decade it was a massive change so you need to be able to react quickly and to 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 be able to deal with it, um, and you might get yeah caught by competitors or by a complete disruptive new technology that all of a sudden kills completely your business case. Yeah, just the velocity of it, and, and that second word behind Jonathan innovation, right? It really could come out and knock you down like like ten pins. Um, guys, that's that's all we have for today. We'll we'll pick this back up because. Uh, Jonathan, I, at some point, I want to sit down and do a session on de-risking investments for commercial space. I think um, I think there's a lot to go here, and I think Luxembourg has sort of led the way in helping us understand that. So, so uh, maybe thanks, maybe Lou, a, a small just an anecdote. Back in sure. the in the 80s, when the, uh, the government had to decide whether they would proceed investing in SES. Uh, uh, that that uh, created a huge debate within the political, um, let's say, environment here, because there was nobody willing to insure them, the, uh, the, uh, insure the risk, and so the the country itself, the government, had to decide: yes, we're going to do this, and this was a huge amount of money for such a small country in that time, and so they decided to go for it, despite the risk and see where Luxembourg is today. Yeah. That's typical the entrepreneurship from my, from my, from my perspective what's still going on today. It's a great anecdote. Jonathan, would you've made that bet back then? I mean, I think again with Luxembourg, yes, Luxembourg also has a specialization in entrepreneurship in which it knows how to spread risk, right? It has access to most of the global um, risk reduction providers whether it be insurance companies 
or other types of um, financial ways to um, reduce risk, which has been key to the growth in the satellite and launch industry because you're able to spread the risk. You don't eliminate it necessarily, except with technological and others, but if you can spread the risk so it's a small part of somebody's larger portfolio, Luxembourg has been on the front end of that, which is why it was able to do the insurance for SES, because then it was able to, you know, um, you know, be able to back end it with reinsurance. I mean, there's a whole case study in that that's quite well. Yeah, very good. Well, listen, gentlemen, thank you so much for being a part of this. Um, great discussion. I hope the audience enjoyed it as much as I did. Um, I know Joe Fargnoli has been sitting patiently by. Um, Joe, you like to listen to people and how they take risks in this industry. Um, now's your time. This is the New York Minute, uh, sponsored by the New York Space Alliance. What'd you hear, my friend? Hey, Lou, thanks for the uh, the handover here. So, you know, you mentioned initially that uh, Luxembourg is a country of 640,000 people. I'm really struck this week by the vision of Putin and Xi meeting in Moscow and forming some level of alliance. You might say, what's the connection between 640,000 people in Luxembourg and that alliance forming? There's some level of cooperation going on between Saudi Arabia and Iran at this point. There's a realignment happening in uh, world relationships that really are very concerning to me. What role are these 640,000 people playing in that? Obviously, this is a country that's punching well above its weight. When the model of the MEO Global Services and the Lux GovSat was discussed, and uh, my ears perked up. This is a very interesting model where the country is putting $200 million into supporting its hometown team of SES, building O3B, which is an excellent constellation, and also making it available to NATO and the United States and creating a venue for carving out other sovereign needs and other national systems. This again is a country punching well above its weight and creating the kind of environment that can promote the development of a a renewed Western alliance using the innovation and energy that comes from commercial space to counter uh, forces that are not aligned with our interests. So I think it's it's very fascinating to see what this you know relatively small country is doing to promote global freedom. Um, but then I take a step back and say, you know, what's that due to? I found the conversation today very interesting, talking about the history of Luxembourg and aerospace, the 100 years of entrepreneurship and innovation in aerospace. And I'm led to wonder what in the history of this country has led to that kind of energy. Whatever it is, I'm sure it's part of having a very robust national university system that's produced a very advanced workforce. This idea of, of cultivating an environment, right? Luxembourg's presence in new space did not fall off of a tree. It was hundreds if not thousands of years in the making of developing a culture and an environment that allowed this kind of functionality to exist. Uh, what then really kind of dropped into focus was Redwire. Redwire comes into play and in my opinion has integrated nine really excellent companies, including Stan Kennedy's, which is probably one of the best acquisitions that Redwire's made. And you know, Redwire is uh, to some extent, I would say looks like a bit of a transnational company that is, is finding really excellent picks and is finding Luxembourg as a center of operations perhaps uh, through which they can conduct this international integration. Uh, Belgian companies, UK companies, American companies. And as we see the uh, geopolitics shifting, that ability to operate uh, across boundaries, finding the best and the best and integrating the new structures that are needed to keep the West as innovative and competitive um, as possible in the face of growing and looming threats is um, you know, really quite exceptional. So Luxembourg creates the environment Great entrepreneurs like Jonathan step in and find ways to integrate the right elements together, creating a very investment worthy company. Therefore, Western interests are propelled forward in the age that we live in. Um, so I, I think it's really a, been a fascinating conversation. And I'm sorry, but I like taking these bigger, you know, uh, 50,000 foot or 500 kilometer viewpoints of these issues. Um, but, you know, this is the kind of thing that I really like saying it's not just a, a country throwing money at a problem. It's a country investing in its infrastructure, investing in its people, investing in creating a posture that is not only friendly, friendly to attracting businesses, but to, to supporting higher visions of the role that a small number of people can play in creating the alliances that will help to protect global freedom and ensure peace and prosperity for more and more people. Joe, I think that's, that's very well said. And Luxembourg itself, 
um, says that it it does what it does for the better of, uh, for the betterment of humankind. So they are thinking about democracy as well. And um, I think you you really accurately pointed out how this sort of goes into the big picture, which I think Jonathan gets concerned about that might be putting too much pressure on the space industry, but it is part of the pie. And, and I, I think we have to strategically acknowledge that. Um, as usual, great we job. well under pressure. As a What's space, that? Industry. space industry performs well under pressure. We, we really do. Yeah, it's it's uh, one of our characteristics. Um, Joe, thanks again. We'll see you next month. Thanks, Lou. Okay. Um, and thanks to the New York Space Alliance uh, for giving us Joe and Rochester, New York, the great city of Rochester for giving us Joe as well. Um, Tamara, let's, let's do a little bit of what's coming up next and then uh, we'll move on. So we got, I know we've got some questions out there. You're on, I think you're on mute. Okay, um, we will be back to our regular cadence of the third Wednesday of the month. Uh, so we will be back um, in April um, on the 19th. And um, we will have a, uh, a session there as we start a new series on um, space infrastructure. So we'll be talking about some of these issues that, uh, that were raised today. And we'll be back again on May 17th with AstroScale uh, and others. So we hope you can register for that now, by the way, and you can sponsor it anytime. So we encourage that. Um, we encourage you also to listen to our podcast every Monday. Uh, we'll be talking with our Better Satellite World Award recipients. Uh, we'll be talking with Hall of Fame inductees making uh, as part of our Making Leaders series. And um, we'll also be hearing from uh, Mark Saras uh, in the conversation that you saw a little bit of today. Uh, in an upcoming podcast. We also have our Space Business Qualified program that we developed with Global VSAT Forum. And SATPROF, the course creator, um, if you're a human resources officer out there or a CEO or a CFO or anyone, and you want people to learn more about the business of space, this is a really accessible online course that Intel SAT and many others uh, have signed on to. So, you know, we're getting to be a bigger industry. We've got a history. We've got you know, many elements to the business. This is a great way to attract talent, which is a big issue, and to keep it. SBQ, spacebq.org. And uh, I think you can take part of the course free to, to test it out. Um, I want to thank everybody. And I know we've got to get to questions now. So Tamara, um, who do we have out there waiting to ask the guys, the gentleman a question? Sure. Um, I've got Mr. Paul Binsfield uh, on tap. I hope he's still here. Just so everybody knows, I have now given everybody the capability to unmute yourself. So if you want to just raise your hand to ask a question, please do. But Paul, if you're here, you're welcome to come on and, and ask your question. Um, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, my question was in terms of the GDP effect of, of space in Luxembourg. And I know, uh, I understand that uh, it's been estimated about 2% of GDP right now. And I know there's obviously upward goals on that. So if anybody have any commentary on how they think space can impact the GDP within Luxembourg and what the time frame might be. Thank you. Um, you wanna go to Luxembourg first and then um, back to Jonathan. Stefan, you wanna take that one on GDP impacts? Uh, yes, I'm struggling a bit with my, oh, there we go. Uh, Can you come on camera, Stefan? If you allow me to, that, yeah, voila. There, there you are. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a question that that should have been asked uh, to, to, to Mark Saras, which, uh, who's heading the, the Luxembourg Space Agency, in fact. Um, so... I really cannot speak on behalf of the government on, on, on this. Um, however, I don't see a space activities in general disappearing in Luxembourg. Um, so it would, I don't think it will uh, drop. It will at least remain at the same level, if not increase. Uh, that's how I see uh, it uh, nowadays. Of course, that all depends on the um political support we have elections uh in october um so that could have an impact uh 
uh, that could change a bit the strategy, although that um, it is it, it is rather something that will stay, uh, I believe. Okay, I've, I've got, I see Paul Steinmetz from the Luxembourg Trade and Investment Office in New York out in the audience. He may want to think about answering this, oh, but yes. Jonathan, um, I'm going to go to you. Um, can you, you want to maybe take a guess at that? I'm sorry, you're on mute, John. Still on mute. I've been unmuted, uh, so I can go ahead if you wish. Sure. Is this Paul? Yeah. Hey, Paul. Hello. Hi. Thank you for, for this very good um, discussion. Uh, and I look forward to the full podcast. Full podcast. Uh, officially, uh, what I remember from our space strategy, which was published a few months ago, is that the share of the space sector in the GDP should double by the end of this decade. Uh, mm -hmm. But um, as you know, we don't believe in uh, in government uh, dictating uh, the um, growth rate of the economy. So we depend, uh, as Mr. Serra said, from uh, uh, bottom-up growth, and it could be more than doubling of the share of space in the GDP. Uh, for us, this is really one of the priority sectors. So, so to, to quote Mark Twain, there are lies, damn lies, and statistics. So we'll wait to see from the bottom up. Uh, very good. That's a tough one. But Jonathan, you want to take a stab at it? I, I can't. Unfortunately, you know, I'm not an expert at uh, Luxembourg uh, economic growth. Or I do know what it's done for the state of Florida. I mean, if you look at the state of Florida, which... Um, you know, really, if, if you don't know, back in 2008, took a significant turn for the worse. Florida has about a trillion dollar economy um, and it went down almost due to real estate. It, it went down almost by 15%, uh, which is a huge uh, decline in overall worth. It's not just the GD GDP didn't go down by 15%, but the overall worth went down. And one of the stars, because remember space generally is not correlated to interest rates or real estate. It's an uncorrelated industry. It provides $6 billion to the Florida industry. And that's that's really from not that, I mean, it was still a pretty big part of 2008, but with the, the decline in budgets at NASA in the 2008, so really within a very short period of time, you've gone from not much more than a billion to $6 billion in mm. Florida. But the other thing is from an employment standpoint, it's gone from a very you know small amount of employment less than 1% to starting to get up into, you know, one to one and a half percent of employment for the state of Florida. 14% is tourism, just to give you a sense of employment. But most importantly, from a GDP standpoint, these are some of the highest paying jobs in Florida. So I'm more familiar with space Florida. And, and obviously Florida is, you know, Florida has almost 25 million people in it. So it's, it's a, and growing. So it's, it's not perfectly analogous to Luxembourg. I think Luxembourg can actually have a bigger impact on its um, economy, but it just, I, I'm sorry to give you some parametrics, but it just gives you a sense how Florida has recovered largely due to the growth in the space industry, commercial space industry, especially since 2008. Yeah, Thank you. Uh, what we didn't mention before is that um, uh, we are planning on a space campus. Actually, we're not planning, we are going right. to build it. So this will attract uh, more business. Yeah, um, thanks, Paul. And Frank Del Bello has done a great job down in Florida. Um, with that's right. That. I mean, that's that's an enormous economic development. I, think. I do recall for, uh, the Netherlands um, in the broadband area that they did something, you know, again similar to what GovSat and others were doing with regard to, to pu public-private collaboration. They organized twenty-three uh, communities there, led by Eindhoven, to develop a high-tech corridor, so to speak, once, you know, because Philips at one point walked out of Eindhoven, they went to China to do their manufacturing, but they kept their R&D, they kept their brains. And that area over time, uh, after taking a, a significant hit economically, now produces, outproduces the entire Dutch economy by about one percentage point GDP. So, you know, this is, these are two similar models that you guys have brought up that seem to work, but, you know, uh, we'll, We'll defer to our national economists to tell us uh, about actual GDP, but I think there's a lot of data out there to support that. Um, Tamara tells me, by the way, that we've got a segment from our conversation with a Mark on at least the national effort to create space as a vertical. Tamara, why don't we play that and, and maybe, again, uh, Mark Saris, 
can give us some insights into this question. And, and it's 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 very organized as well. And what I what I find most intriguing, Mark, is the way the agency is shaped to support industries. Uh, I mean, I had the privilege of moderating a panel uh, and a presentation uh, in New York by by Luxembourg uh, on the subject. And what I found interesting is the, is the degree to which you have harnessed the resources, uh, both national, intellectual, and educational, uh, cultural resources, to this economic effort, right? So you're, again, as a small country, but a highly educated one, uh, one with great science, you've been able to mobilize this as, as a vertical industry. Uh, am, I, am I describing that right for the audience? I, you know, here uh, the it's um, I should, maybe it's necessary also to to give a bit of background here on 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 why we have put so much focus on on this economic development. Uh, Luxembourg has always been depending on specific economic sectors, and and those who know Luxembourg know as well that today the financial services represent really a very big part of our economy. I think we depend really on that. It's more than 30% of GDP. And uh, we have gone through that also with the steel industry in the 60s, for example, which has nearly completely disappeared now. And, and this was a strong motivation to continue diversifying the economy in Luxembourg. And, uh, and space has been, as I mentioned, since the 80s, a, um, uh, an opportunity that has been identified. And we have also given, or the government has really given new dynamic to it when we started the Space Resources in a, uh, the .lu initiative in 2016, which has really put Luxembourg on the map worldwide. And uh, and yeah, and we had to, as you said, to really to, to rely on all the, um, how should I, should I say, the, uh, uh, the building blocks we had already in the right. country and uh, and um, yeah, this the fact that we are such an open country that uh, we speak so many languages that uh, you know we are really a mix of many cultures here uh, makes it quite uh, a good place to develop these uh, activities. Uh, again, space is not something that is really that is local. I think very very quickly you are addressing uh, global issues global markets and uh, and so from that perspective we really have used also our strength to develop this ecosystem here in Luxembourg yeah yeah and, and again what I what I like about that from the economic development and, and uh, foreign direct investment perspective is that you you really didn't have to remobilize or create a new type of, of Luxembourg I mean all of those assets were there you just very intelligently mobilize them for the purposes of the next phase of, of the economy. As you said, we move from steel, right, to communications, to digital, and now to commercial space. And these are these are continuously expanding industries. And somehow you you manage to figure that out uh, and get there before most other people. OK, um, that's enough of me. Um, last word on that subject. Um, I think Tam is telling me we're out of time, um, unfortunately. Paul Steinmetz, did you want to? Did you have something to say to add to that? Uh, I I just like to perhaps add a fact, not 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 uh, later than three four days ago, the government announced a new tranche of the Luxembourg Future Fund. So what happened is that uh, we've spent the first few hundred million on companies of which space companies like Spire and the government went ahead and uh, launched a second tranche of 200 million uh, euros. So the money is there, uh, the priorities are clear. We are developing uh, a tech sector uh, led by the space uh, sector. Uh, so that's good news. And I just wanted to, to inform you about this. Thank Very you. good. Well, that is, that is good news. Uh, well, I think there was a lot of uh, good news today, and I really want to thank everybody who participated here. Um, and keep your eye on Luxembourg, and certainly keep your eye uh, on Redwire. And we hope you always uh, come back.
to see us at the New York Space Business Roundtable. Uh, we remind you at SSPI uh, that we're here to make a better satellite world and we're asking you to go out and do it too. I wanna welcome someone, by the way, Anthony Colucci, who became a lifetime member of SSPI and uh, you can do that too. It's $1,000 one time and you become a member uh, of the Space and Satellite Professionals International Organization for the rest of your life and you get inv invited to uh, great events like our Hall of Fame induction. Um, we take you out for a pasta dinner when you're in New York. We introduce you to Paul Steinmetz. We do all kinds of things when you're a lifetime member. So Anthony, thank you very much for, for joining us. Um, on behalf of SSPI and our entire organization and chapters around the world, I want to thank our producer, Tamara Bond-Williams, who did a terrific job uh, even after a long week in Washington last week. Randall Barney, who's behind the scenes uh, as our backstop here today. Um, thank you all in the audience as well for your questions and your attention, and we will see you next month. Take care, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you Thanks, guys. Ciao.